guys study the Bible through the years, certain things just sort of make a register. They make a connection in my mind. And I think, you know, I'd really love to preach on that sometime. And so uh, this is one of those sometimes. And as I was teaching through the Gospel of Matthew some years ago, I was really struck by the person, by the man, Pontius Pilate. And so that's what we're going to take a look at this morning is Pontius Pilate and what his life and his decision, or maybe I should say his lack of decision, how it connects to us. So Father, we pray for a blessing on your word this morning. Prepare our hearts to receive something in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Verse 2 makes it very plain that they led him away to Pontius Pilate, the governor. You see, the Sanhedrin gave them over to this man who was the Roman ruler of the province of Judea. This man, Pontius Pilate, was appointed by Tiberius Caesar to the office that he held just a few years before. And other writers at that time, writers who aren't in the Gospels, but secular writers, they tell us a little something about this man Pontius Pilate and his character. They tell us that he was a cruel and a ruthless man, and that he was almost completely insensitive to the feelings of the people that he governed. In other words, he governed over Jewish Judea, yet he didn't care almost anything about them. He didn't care about offending them in the slightest. He was a brutal man, and surely the religious leaders believed that if we brought Jesus to this man, we would get an execution, because he doesn't care about anybody. Now, Pilate wouldn't be interested in the charge that got Jesus convicted before the religious leaders. Those were charges of blasphemy and so forth. Nevertheless, he would be interested in charges of treason or of rebellion against Caesar. And so those were the charges that they brought to Pilate, bringing Jesus before him, saying, Pilate, please send this man to the cross. Would you convict him of the crimes? Now we're going to skip over verses 3 through 10, which describe the end of Judas, which we don't need to get into this morning. I want to pick it up where the narrative picks up with Pilate again, starting at verse 11. Look at it with me, please. Now, as Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? So Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word so that, the, so that the governor marveled greatly. Friends, could you just see this scene in your mind for a few moments? There is Jesus standing before a Roman governor of a province, Pontius Pilate. It says there in verse 11, now Jesus stood before the governor. Now I have to tell you this. Matthew does some condensing of the full account of Jesus' trials. Actually, when you piece them all together from the four Gospels, we see that Pilate actually had two audiences with Jesus. That he came before Pilate a first time, and Pilate said, you know what, I don't want to deal with this. Go to Herod. And he sent him off to Herod, who was the ruler over Galilee. Well, Jesus didn't get anywhere with Herod, and so Herod sent him back to Pilate. So he essentially had two appearances before Pilate, and just sort of for the sake of condensing the story, uh, Matthew mentions only the second appearance before Pilate. Now, just as Jesus refused to say anything to defend himself before Herod, so now he refused to say anything to defend himself before Pilate. And so Pilate asked the contemptuous question in verse 11, Are you the king of the Jews? You see, when they brought him before Pilate, the Jewish leaders accused Jesus of promoting himself as a king in defiance to Caesar. And they wanted to make Jesus seem like a dangerous revolutionary or terrorist against the Roman Empire. Therefore, Pilate asked Jesus this very simple question. Jesus, this man on trial before me, are you the king of the Jews? 
And we can only wonder what Pilate might have thought at that particular moment when he set eyes on Jesus and when he saw this beaten and bloodied man. Because I want you to know, Jesus was already well into the physical sufferings of his ordeal by this point. He had already been beaten. He had already been mocked. He had already been spat upon. And when Pilate saw this beaten and bloodied man, he looked at him first and he goes, you know what? This doesn't look like any king I've ever seen before in my life. I've seen Caesar, Pilate would say. Tiberius Caesar appointed him. He spent time in Rome. He saw Caesar with his own eyes, and he realized that man's no no Caesar. He doesn't look like that kind of a king. The Roman governor was probably sarcastic or ironic in his tone when he asked that question, are you the king of the Jews? In the ancient grammar, the emphasis is on the word you. As if Pilate, you? Really, you? I never seen a king beaten and bloodied like this before me at this time. You? And notice what Jesus' response was. Verse 11, Jesus' response said, it is as you said. In other words, you said it. Nothing more to say. And Jesus offered no majestic defense, no instant miracle to save his own life, which he could have done. Do we not agree on that? That Jesus could have just, you know, called down a little fire from heaven right there. Had a little angelic appearance with a flaming sword. That would have persuaded Pilate. Jesus could have done so many things at that moment, but he didn't. He just simply said, you say I'm king of the Jews? It is as you say. Now this amazed Pilate. First he said, verse 13, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? Uh, Pilate wouldn't believe that such a strong, dignified man, even as beaten and as bloodied as he was, that he would just stand there in the face of all these accusations. No wonder it says there in verse 14. Did you see it? Verse 14 says, the governor marveled greatly. He looks at Jesus standing before him and he goes, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't add up. What I see in this man doesn't correspond to the accusations that are made against him. It doesn't correspond to the lack of defense that he gives. Because I'll tell you this, Pilate had seen the face of what you might call courageous fanaticism in the Jewish prisoners that he had been imprisoned before this time. Pilate had sent many men to his death, and he knew the look of a crazy man. And he said, no, that man's not crazy. And Pilate also knew something else. He he knew the look of a prisoner who was filled with fear. No doubt about it. Pilate had looked at Jesus and he said, this man is not afraid. It didn't add up. And you can know this for sure as well. That Pontius Pilate had seen many men get on their knees and grovel before them and beg for their life. And Jesus wouldn't grovel. Jesus wouldn't beg. Instead, Pilate looked at Jesus and he understood all of this. He looked at Jesus and he saw an amazing combination of love and strength and humility and majestic dignity. Pilate saw the calm and the strength of a completely innocent man who had an absolutely unshakable faith in God and it blew his mind. Pilate's thinking the wheels are turning in his mind. I've never seen a man like this before. No wonder that the text tells us that he marveled greatly. Now look at it here in verse 15. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Do you see the picture here? As Pilate looks at Jesus and realizes there's something different about this man. This man is innocent. This man is majestic. He's like no other prisoner who's ever stood before me. He's thinking, I've got to find a way out of this. This man is innocent. I can't send him to the cross. It would be wrong. It would be a crime. I'm not going to do that to an innocent man. So the wheels start turning. And he remembers at Passover time, there's the custom where we release a man who's imprisoned, a Jewish man. We do it as a favor to the multitude. I'll make Jesus the man we release. And that was Pilate's whole plan. And then he says, verse 
19, excuse me, verse uh, 18 there, if you notice it. He says, for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Do you know what that means? Let me put it this way. It does not say he knew that they handed him over because of guilt, because he wasn't guilty. It doesn't say he knew that they handed him over because Jesus had done something terrible. No, he knew that this was an innocent man who was only in his courtroom because of the envy of the religious leaders. Then at verse 19, something remarkable happened. Something that really captured my attention. I hope it captures yours as well. Look at it there, verses 19 and 20. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, In other words, Pilate's sitting there, and I picture him there, his head in his hands. He goes, how do I figure this out? How do I get this man released? He's an innocent man. I feel myself in a box. What am I supposed to do? While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. So while he sits on the judgment seat, and as he's there as a judge, what he does is he fails to give the accused man justice. Do you realize at this point, Pilate had all the evidence he needed to set Jesus free? All the evidence. He saw the strength and the dignity of Jesus, and he could look at him. Pilate was a man who could read men, I'm supposing, and Pilate could look at that man and say, this man is no criminal, he's no revolutionary. And he knew that it was no just charge that brought Jesus before his judgment seat. It was only the envy of the religious leaders. And he looked at Jesus and he saw a man who was so at peace with his God that he didn't need to answer a single accusation. And he had already declared, according to Luke chapter 23, he had already declared that Jesus was innocent because on his first visit before Pilate, this is what Pilate said. Pilate said about Jesus, I find no fault in this man. I don't know how many of you have seen the inside of a courtroom, at least from the side of an accused. Maybe more of you than I really care to know. But even if it was for something simple like a traffic ticket, wouldn't you love it if the judge looked down upon you and said, I find no fault in this man? I find no fault in this woman? What would you say? Yes, thank you, judge. I'll be on my way now. That's what Pilate pronounced over Jesus I find no fault in this man. He had already said that, yet Jesus was still there before the judgment seat of Pilate. And Pilate feels boxed in. What am I going to do? And then at that moment, somebody comes up, and I don't know if they handed him a note. I don't know if they whispered in his ear, but he got a message from his wife. Look at it there in verse 19. His wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. Friends, this is absolutely mind-blowing because in addition to all the other evidence that Pilate had so that he could know who Jesus was and give him a proper acquittal, God gave him one other evidence. He gave him his wife's dream. Now, we can only conjecture what Pilate's wife saw in this dream. Perhaps she saw Jesus, an innocent man, crowned with thorns and crucified. Maybe she saw Jesus coming with glory with the clouds of heaven. Maybe she saw Jesus at the great white throne of judgment and she saw her husband being judged by Jesus. I don't know what she saw in the dream, but I do know this, that that dream was so powerful that it persuaded her, look at it there, verse 19, it persuaded her that Jesus was a just man have nothing to do with this just man. I know that he's just, I've never met this man Jesus before, but I had a dream and this dream spoke to me so powerfully that I know that he is a just man. And we also know that that dream was so powerful, look at it there in verse 19, that it made her suffer. Have nothing to do with that just man for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. It was part dream part nightmare, waking her suddenly with something like a panic attack. 
I've got to do something about this. And you've got to admit it's a remarkable occurrence. She, she woke up in the morning disturbed by the dream. She asked, where's my husband? And, and her attendants tell her, well, your husband's gone off to do his business. The, the religious leaders have brought to him a prisoner that he has to judge this morning. And in a panic, she says, a prisoner, I had a dream about that man. Send this message to my husband immediately. Get word to him that he has to let him go. You know, most of our dreams are entirely forgettable. I'm not a man with a very active dream life. My wife, on the other hand, she's brilliant at entertaining dreams. Sometimes it's happened with my wife, Ingelo, that sometimes uh, she has these amazing dreams in the morning where a whole, like, story is being spelled out for her. And And the story will be so great that she'll wake up and she'll intentionally go back to sleep so that she can get back into the dream and see how the story ends. Now look, even if a dream is so entertaining and so remarkable that you just want to live in it for a little bit, you have to say that most of our dreams are entirely forgettable and they have no great spiritual meaning. But every once in a while, we may have a dream that is so important, or at least it seems to be so important to us. Yet none of us, I don't think that there's probably a single person in this room that has ever had a dream that shook you so much that you instantly sent a message to a judge in a courtroom telling you to leave the accused off as innocent. That's quite a dream, don't you think? I mean, this was not a normal disruption whatsoever. But because that dream was so meaningful to her, there was a great urgency about her message to Pilate. She was bold to send it, and she implored her husband, have nothing to do with this man Jesus. Let him go. Send him away. Don't punish him even a little bit. And friends, this is what I want you to see. God sent Pontius Pilate a dramatic warning that he ignored. God sent a merciful message to Pilate. Don't you see this is God's mercy to Pilate? Pontius Pilate, I'm giving you every opportunity to escape the judgment that you will surely face if you send this man to the cross. And yet Pilate ignored that message of mercy. Verse 20 says, But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask Barabbas, ask for Barabbas, and destroy Jesus. You see, the religious leaders understood the best way to influence Pilate. Not through his own judgment of Jesus, not through his wife, and not even through the religious leaders themselves directly. No, they understood the best way to push Pilate in a particular direction was through the multitudes. Get popular opinion flowing one way, and Pilate will just go along with the current. That man doesn't have the courage to stand against popular opinion, at least at this point. And friends, I think of what a powerful thing that is for us today. You know, there's many of you, you are people of tremendous courage. Man, you'll fight, you'll be bold, you'll be courageous, except when it comes to popular opinion. You'll make a stand against so many things, but when it comes right down to it, whatever the crowd says, that's what you'll say. Whatever the crowd does, that's what you'll do. And Pilate was in that same box. Here was a man who knew the right thing to do, and he knew it in so many convincing ways, yet nevertheless, he did the wrong thing. He did a terrible thing, and he did it following the multitudes. We'll look at it here, starting at verse 21. Then the governor answered and said to them, Which of these two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? And they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Do you understand something remarkable there? Look at what Pilate said right there in that verse when he said, what evil has he done? When Pilate asked that question, what evil has he done? Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. You don't ask that question of a man you know is guilty. And John specifically records in the Gospel of John that Pilate said again, 
that Jesus was innocent. Let me just quote these verses to you. John 18, 38, Pilate says, I find no fault in him at all. And then later on in John chapter 19, verse 4, Pilate said, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Innocent, 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 over and over again. And by the way, it's at this point in the trial that Pilate had a dialogue with Jesus about truth. Jesus said to him, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate cynically responded. It's in John chapter 18, verses 37 and 38. Pilate cynically responded with the question, what is truth? See, Pilate felt he knew that truth was the legions of Rome. Truth was the uh, power of Caesar in an ivory palace in, a, in um, a Rome. Truth was the multitudes that can push me in certain directions. And Jesus said, no, I stand before you as the truth. Now look at it here, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, the, the crowd was getting more and more excited, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Now, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, this is so out of character for this man, Pontius Pilate. From what we know of him from secular history, he's sort of the man who ruled with his philosophy, off with their heads, I don't care, slaughter a bunch of them. Let the blood flow just as long as everybody knows that I'm in charge. But this man who was otherwise courageous to a fault in front of the people, this time he bows to their will. But it shows us that he could have chosen differently. Instead, he said, no, you see to it. And you saw it right there in verse 24. He took water and he washed his hands before the multitude. You can picture that in your mind, can't you? Can't you picture Pontius Pilate with a basin of water dramatically washing his hands as if he's saying, no, I don't bear the stain of this. My hands are clean. You can't lay this one on him. Listen, he was trying to say that it was out of his control and that he didn't have the responsibility. But friends, this is what I'm trying to tell you. He did have the responsibility even though he claimed that he didn't. See, it wasn't enough for Pilate to say, I don't find any fault to him. It wasn't enough for him to look for a clever solution to try to release another prisoner. And washing your hands, it's meaningless. Pilate, you can wash your hands all day long, but you still bear the responsibility, and he could never escape it. Matter of fact, Pontius Pilate is forever associated with the crime of sending Jesus to the cross. I find it most remarkably echoed throughout the history of all the church in one of the great creeds, the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, which has been probably literally recited billions of times by believers throughout the centuries. The Apostle Creed reads this in its opening. It reads, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, look at it, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. Friends, how much good did that washing of water do? Nothing, nothing. Matter of fact, he also protested. Did you see what he said there in verse 24? As he washed his hands, he cried out, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. And hidden in his attempt at self-justification is another declaration of Jesus' innocence. So I know I'm sending an innocent man to the cross, but it's not me. You can wash your hands all day long. It's not going to do any good. Just because Pilate said, I am innocent, it doesn't mean that he was innocent. So after he had washed his hands, Pilate had Jesus beaten, whipped, and mocked as a king. Pilate then stood Jesus before the crowd, hoping that their bloodlust would be satisfied. And in one of the most dramatic scenes of the entire New Testament, he stood that bloodied, beaten man clothed in purple with a crown of thorns upon his head. He stood him before the multitude. And as John chapter 19, verse 5 describes, he says, behold the man. That's what he said. He wanted the whole crowd to look at Jesus as if he was saying, isn't it enough? 
Haven't we mocked this man enough? Haven't we made him suffer enough? But instead, the crowd said, no, no, crucify him. And Pilate did one last thing as he sent Jesus to the cross. He commanded that they put this inscription above the cross. You can read it in Matthew chapter 27, verse 37, where it says, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. In a sense, it was Pilate's way of saying, even though I send this man to the cross, I'm going to publish the truth about him right above his head. This is the truth about him. This is the king of the Jews. Now, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, ends up being an example to every one of us about how we can get so much right about Jesus, but still end up rejecting him. Now, I want you to think about all the things that Pilate had right about Jesus. He looked at Jesus and he examined him. That's a good thing to do. I hope you're doing that today. I hope you're considering Jesus, that you're examining him in, in the mind, uh, in your own mind and heart. You can look at Jesus and marvel greatly about him. Wow, look at him. What an amazing man. I've never seen a man like this. I read a man and I see there's never a man of this kind of love, of this kind of grace, of this kind of compassion. Look at Jesus. I marvel at him greatly. You can look at Jesus and know that other people reject him from bad motives and reasons. He knew that that's why the religious leaders, no for any good reason, but because of envy. Yes, I understand that, Jesus, that other people reject you out of bad motives. And you can hope to do Jesus a favor by trying to benefit him in some way. You can even receive a supernatural revelation about Jesus. Was not that dream a supernatural revelation? Pilate received it and then rejected it. You can know that Jesus is innocent. You can try to excuse or justify your own rejection of Jesus. You can proclaim that you have an interest in the truth. You can call the attention of others to Jesus and say, as it were, behold the man. You can write or publish the truth about Jesus, even as Pilate wrote, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. You can do all of that and still end up rejecting him. I don't know if there's a more tragic figure in the scriptures than Pontius Pilate. But there could be an equal tragedy here today. For somebody to think all of this about Jesus, for somebody to have so much right about Jesus, and yet they never have this right. Let's say, I know you are an innocent man. I know you are God-made man. I give my life to you. I submit my life to you. One of the reasons why I've been itching to give this message is because it's kind of been stirring through my mind, through my heart for well, a couple years now. You know, it just kind of gets put on the back burner and I think about it from time to time. But then I thought, what a perfect morning for me to share this when we're going to have communion together. In a few moments, we're going to bring out the bread and the cup of communion. And when we do that, when we bring out the bread and the cup, it'll be an invitation for you to put yourself there in a real sensory experience so that you can taste something, so that you can touch something, so that you can feel something that will connect you with what Jesus did at the cross. But this is what I want you to understand. That unless you come to Jesus by faith right here, right now, you could eat four or five loaves of bread. You could drink from the biggest cup in the world. None of it will do you any good. But yet Jesus he stands before you, and he essentially says, what are you going to do with me? What are you going to do with me right here, right now? Now, when we take communion in a few moments, it's only open. We pass it all the way down the rows, but I want you to know that if you're going to be steadfast in refusing to give your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to let it pass by. If you're going to reject Jesus, and look, n nobody's looking. The point isn't for people to look around and see who takes it and doesn't take it. That, that, that has nothing to do with it. 
But I say this for the benefit of your own life. If you're not willing to submit to a crucified Savior and say, Jesus, I recognize you for who you are in every aspect, then let it pass. But you know what's exciting to think? Today, right here, right now, could be the morning when you do accept. When you do say, Jesus, this is for me. And so I'm going to pray right now. In the midst of my prayer, I'm going to give an invitation. And as just part of that invitation, I'm just going to ask you to, to prepare your heart and to let your acceptance or rejection of communion be the demonstration of your new life in Jesus Christ. But, but as we do that, I want you to do it all in the idea, let's prepare ourselves to come to the Lord's table. Father in heaven, we realize that in a sense, Jesus is set before each and every one of us, and we're still um, confronted with what are we going to do with this man. Jesus, I, I pray for those who, um, who need this morning to say, no, Jesus, I, I'm tired of rejecting you. I'm going to surrender to you. Lord, we realize that even though it seemed like Pilate was in judgment of Jesus, really it was Pilate, the one who was under judgment here. The decision was much more about him than it was about Jesus. And so we realize for ourselves. Father, would you prepare hearts right here, right now, to in faith, put their trust in who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross, how he went to the cross to redeem us, to buy us out of our sin and our slavery. And that when we put our loving trust upon him, he rescues us. Lord, would you move upon hearts now to receive that? In Jesus' name.